Hi, everybody. Okay, today we are joined by Mr. Silas Walton, founder of A Collected Man, and definitely one of the leading lights in terms of the world of watch dealing. Um, Silas, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure, Mark. Always nice to talk to you. Me too, mate. Um, you know, one, there are many incredible aspects about A Collected Man. And uh, one of the things that really sticks out to me is the fact that you guys always know what's going to be the next hot thing. Like you're just so prescient in terms of like what's special that people haven't really noticed yet. And I'll be very frank to admit that um, I purchased from you guys quite a while back this Daniel Roth and this Frank Mueller well before they were kind of brands that were on my radar. And I was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about kind of what turned you onto these brands in the first place and what do you think is special about these brands and even these particular watches if you have time for it. Sure. So, I mean, that's very kind of you to, uh, to sort of introduce me very generously like that. I'm, um, you know, uh, we have always been, and, and personally, but we have always been passionate about independent watchmaking. So that was the sort of starting point, you know, artisanal craftsman, um, craft work has, has always kind of captured the imagination, um, you know, in the office, uh, amongst my colleagues, amongst our clients. Um, and, I think what happened was at a certain point, you kind of you 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 understand the landscape of independent watchmaking as it as it sits today. You kind of you've you've discovered the different corners, the different niches, you know, you're discovering new things. But at a certain point, you start to think, especially when you're in the pre-owned space, you know, what 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 came before or where, where did it start? You know, you know, is independent did independent watchmaking exclusively start with Philippe Dufour? Um you know, what, what's the difference between modern Jean and early Jean? Mm. Is there a difference? Um, if you like vintage watches, is there something, are there vintage examples uh, of independent watchmaking, something that most people think, you know, is a very recent phenomenon? Um, most collectors have only discovered independent watchmaking, you know, more broadly in the last couple of years. But independent watchmaking is a phenomenon that dates back 20, 30 years. Mm. Um, and the concept of neo-vintage watchmaking uh, which I think is particularly interesting, um, is this sort of like this this watchmaking that crosses between the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And when neo-vintage watchmaking and independent watchmaking kind of transact, you have Daniel Roth, and you have early Frank Muller, you have early Roger Dubuis, you know, to, you, you even have early F.P. Jean. And, um, you know, that, that sort of curiosity about where everything started you know, and, and, and why things are the way they are today, how they've changed in some cases, because I think, you know, modern Daniel Roth and modern Frank Miller are very different to early Daniel Roth and early Frank Miller, um, you know, really, really sort of started us down um, this particular kind of rabbit hole of curiosity and discovery that, that led us to, to the two watches that you, um, that you, you, you're sharing today. Um, hmm. And I think, I think it's uh, it's a fascination uh, born born of curiosity, but that sustained by the sheer breadth and depth of the kind of wealth of of you know different examples of fantastic independent watchmaking that exists in that period. Hmm. Uh, to me, there's almost a certain complexity to independent watchmaking. You know, I guess maybe because they were more risk takers, so they were more willing to to push the envelope. You know, aesthetically and in terms of complications as well. I think. Well, it's entrepreneurship, isn't it? It's it's sort of how do you stand out in a busy field of established successful brands? Um, we see it all the time today, you know, brands that try and brands that aspire to be as good as something that already exists, that itself is pretty much peak um, of its respective kind of category or position in the market struggle because people are always going to compare you to that thing that's already great. And it's likely that you're never going to be able to really mimic that to an extent that people forget the old thing that like dominated that that space and 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 you know substitute you uh, in its place mm. um i was thinking about you know i went on a tour of an english vineyard recently and and tried some english sparkling wine that's amazing you know really really good but it's not champagne and as try as much as they will to try and you know convince people that it's champagne it's not champagne it's very 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 good quality but it doesn't have the same aura and it doesn't have the same kind of cachet and I think that what happened is, you know, brands like Roth and Frank Muller, you know, they recognized that they had to 
um, they had to kind of cut their own path. Now, I think Frank Muller did that much more aggressively later. And so in many ways, you could say that early Frank Muller is an homage to more classic watchmaking. Um, but I think that, you know, he and Roth both had a really independent vision for what they wanted their brands to be. Um, and they set themselves out, particularly Roth, when you look at the shape of his cases and you look at the path, you know, the design language that he used, he really, really tried to combine the best of the kind of old school, the, the movement, the movement finishing, um, the Poinçon de Genève, all these different things. Um, I believe he had Poinçon de Genève, I may be wrong, but in any case, he really went for, you know, the, the best of the best in terms of what he pursued as a watchmaker. And he combined it with a really unique identity and design, those pinstripe dials, um, you know, the case shapes, you know, even Frank Muller, the kind of like the, the dial design is not the same as everyone else's. It looks quite classical, but in many ways, it's very different from anything uh, anyone else was doing. So, yeah, both of them, both of them were at the start of their respective journeys and both of them were determined to um, to, to be clear in what they stood for. Um, mm. It's interesting to see where they went. But I think it's particularly interesting to see where they started. And where How would you characterize these two? Because they're similar in that they really, you know, did new things, but they're very different as well. How would you characterize each of them? So, um, so Frank Miller obviously was the um, the master of complications, um, a sort of uh, uh, what's the expression? Um, you know the the kind of like not the the not the the dark or naughty child, but he was he always sort of presented himself, and I think that's his reputation of being you know rather extraordinary and 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 kind of um, determined to go his own path. So I think Frank Muller was both of them were brilliant, brilliant watchmakers. Both of them you know had accomplished a huge amount um, by the time they started their own brands. So they were both kind of you know in that sense. Uh, as credible as it was possible to be. Both of them were inspired by um, things that had come before, obviously with Roth. Um, you know, he was very, very influential in the um, re-establishment of Breguet um, and was really a sort of pioneer of, of, of um, the kind of the combination of, of you know, bringing an, a, a really old traditional brand into the kind of, uh, into the modern world, but in a really tasteful and sophisticated way. Yeah. Uh, and I, he applied that philosophy and approach very successfully to Daniel Roth when he created something eponymous under his own name. And I think Frank Muller, um, uh, again, you know, he, he sort of, he had this, this incredible background and experience. For example, I think he, um, he took care of a lot of the Pateks and service a lot of the Pateks and we saw a lot of the Pateks that went into the Patek Museum. So, so in many in many ways, they both had this uber classic, uber traditional, uber high end sort of foundation. Uh, but they both had very strong independent spirits. They were both mm. you know, very entrepreneurial. It's it's basically entrepreneurial watchmaking. That's it. Mm. And they decided that they wanted to do something. They were going to do it. They both to you know use Lemania based movements, one slightly higher end than the other, because they were placing their products in different bits of the market. But they both said, you know, need something fundamentally that's really high quality. Um, and they both, you know, uh, very clearly developed their own design palette that that subsequently went on to, you know, result in a whole load of fascinating um, creations. But yeah, they're, they're both very original and very ahead of their time. Absolutely. Do you have any specific details you'd like to touch on with, let's start with the Daniel Roth. Yeah, so I think, you know, both uh, the Daniel Roth stands out for a number of reasons, other than the quality of the watchmaking, obviously it's the, um, it's the uh, is it Epsilo Curvex is the technical term, the Epsilo Curvex case shape. Um, and then obviously the pinstripe guilloche dial. Those are the two things that are quintessential, quintessential, quintessential Daniel Roth. Mm. Um, you know, obviously you combine that with a, a really excellent uh, base movement, um, which I believe is the Le Mania base movement in the in the chronograph. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's it, it, you know, I, years and years ago, before I really got into, before I really, before I had my first Roth. You know, I didn't like that case shape at all. I remember five, six, seven, eight years ago seeing that case shape and thinking, "Oh, that's that's odd." You know, I, I think that's a, you know, I want a round case shape. That's it. Don't don't give me something strange. But then the moment I wore it on my wrist, I loved it. And it was one of those things where it like flicked a switch, and 
I, to this day, I can't really, you know, sometimes you can remember how you felt about something in the past and you can almost put yourself back there. Hmm. I can't remember what it was, the feeling that I had that was negative towards that case shape, because now it just feels so natural and, and, and fantastic. But there was a time when I didn't like it. But the case shape, the, the dial detail, the quality of the movement, the quality of the finishing, you know, those really stand out for me in the Roth. Um, and it's a black dial, which um, I can't speak to the exact rarity, but I know that we saw far fewer of the black dials in the um, with the earlier movements than we did subsequently, you know, manual winding movements. And pardon me for mentioning this, but you had a beautiful Roth tourbillon at one point, didn't you? I did. I had a, a really fantastic um, steel Roth tourbillon um, that I went out of my way to, to find, to source. Um, and, uh, it was one of 20 made for an Italian retailer. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a watch that during lockdown, I, um, I, I really scoured, scoured the place to find and, um, uh, you know, but for the fact that today, as is always the case, you know, now I'm, I'm commissioning independent watchmakers for watches. I'm, I'm basically selling a lot of the pieces that I collected over the years in order to fund, uh, pieces that I'll be receiving in the next couple of years. Um, but for that, I would still have it on my wrist today. But it was one of the nicest watches I ever owned. And, and it's, gone, yeah, it's gone to a very good home. So I'm very happy. Oh, fabulous. I love that thing. That thing was genius, you know. Um, don't, don't make me don't make me regret it. I'll, uh, <laughs> I, I was already, you know, it, it sometimes, you know, you just have to, you have to do what you have to do. No, I know what you mean. I mean, I'm literally selling a whole watch collection. <laughs> yeah. Long, for, for reasons along the same line as yours. Okay, what about the Frank Mueller? Yeah, so, you know, it, it's one of those things where people always, you know, people crave interesting things, interesting places with interesting stories. It's, it's the, you know, it's the story as old as time itself. Um, you, you, you start off, we started off with a very limited amount of knowledge about independent watchmaking and and Jean and and you know Roger's work and Philippe's work and Carrie's work, and then you kind of develop. You discover there's something called Roche de Brie, and you discovered early Roche de Brie with these amazing movements and amazing you know incredible kind of story and and, and design language. Then you discover early Daniel Roth. And you're like, oh, that's cool. How you know what if we scratch below the surface of that? Where do we go? Or oh, there's early Breguet, you know, from the Roth period. And that's like, oh, that's that's really cool too. Um, and then it's like, well, what else is there? Well, there's early Frank Muller. Um, you know, it's a bit a bit of a pattern emerges and mm -hmm. early Parmigiani. And and I think that you know, with with Frank Muller, again, you had someone who wanted to create something that was under his own name that was distinct, but that was inspired by all the watchmaking that he loved from the days that he worked at Patek. He also wanted, I think, place it at a price point that was more accessible. Uh, and I think that was, you know, very, very relevant in his decision as to which movements to use, which Lemania based movements to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, in many ways, what I love about early Frank Muller is how unbelievably removed it is from, from, from the modern brand. You know, it's almost it's almost anomalous. It, it catches people off guard. You tell them, you know, the number, I remember the gentleman, the first time I saw early Frank Muller was in the collection of a gentleman who was collecting early Rouge de Brie and early Roth and other things. And I was like, what the hell is this? Like, this isn't, this isn't something I'm familiar with. Um, and, and then, yeah, you went, you went into that and you discovered that there were the whole range of interesting additional things that were available. And, you know, I think <clears throat> unlike Roth, which kind of continued quite a lot down the same path of design, uh, for a very long time. Um, and unlike, uh, Rouge du Brie, who broadly speaking, you know, had again, quite a broad range of different options, different case shapes, the sympathies, you know, different sizes of homage, et cetera. You know, you don't see many early Frank Muller's. Uh, it's not it's not common, you know, today, you know, for every early Frank Muller I see, I see maybe two or three or four early Roche de Brise and, and obviously maybe 10, 10, 10, 10 or so Roths. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's much less common to see them. Um, I think they were made in in much smaller numbers before he moved on to something else. But I, I don't know that for a fact, but that was something that I always got the impression of. Um, and I think, again, it's just that it's that it's that curiosity and, and situating early Roth, early Muller, early Debris, early Parmigiani mm. and early others in their sort of, you know, that that period of creativity where there was a lot of risk and nobody did, was doing it. You know, it was it was ballsy. 
like I love how the Frank Miller reflects Frank's time at Patek because the early yeah. stuff is very Patek flavored for sure. Yeah, you know, yeah, in a good way. Much. Yeah, I, mean, I totally. suppose you can almost say things like Frill and Mari today, right, are very Patek flavored as well. So it's yeah, like several generations after what Frank started with. Yeah, totally. I, I you know, I, I think that inspiration um, came from the best of the best. You know, mm. it was it was inspired by exposure to and restoring some of the the, the best watches that were ever made. And mm. um, you know, I, I think anyone who's curious about these things should watch um, Way's video about the recent Frank Muller release. And yeah, because um, that's basically know, a thirty nine millimeter version of this, really, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That you know, there's a there's a lot there's a lot to discover there, and there's a lot of interesting a lot of interesting history. But it's um, you know, it's 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 very cool. It is very cool. It's funny, actually, those you know those double-sided Frank Mullers? Yeah, 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 yeah. They yeah. are amazing. I, I came across one with a Japanese collector a few months ago, and I was like, wow, <clears> it's an unbelievable piece. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. very, right, very man. unusual. Well, listen, um, I didn't want to take up too much of your time, because I know you're a very busy man, and we're doing this on a Saturday morning, when I'm sure you've got plenty of other things to do. Um, any closing thoughts? Any exciting things coming up at A Collective Man these days? Uh, well, look, we're all looking forward to the Christmas break. We've just had our Smith auction, which we were very lucky. Oh, that's right. Um, Congratulations on the Smith auction. Thank you very that much. Was yeah, legendary. That was, that was incredible. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was that was uh, that was really cool. We um, I was really very, very happy with the outcome and very grateful um, to everyone that took part and, and kind of all the kind coverage and assistance we had. Um, so I think the team has earned a very deserved holiday. Um, we've got some really cool vintage collectibles dropping in the next few weeks before Christmas. We always try and do a, a series of cool drops because people always want something for stocking fillers. Um, mm. So definitely watch this space. Um, and otherwise, no, looking forward to looking forward to a break and coming back with uh, um, enthusiasm and a spring in our step in, in, in the early year, early new year. Okay. One last thing. Sure. Next big brand, do you think? Ah, uh, well, it's the question that I always get asked, um, and there's never a, there's never an easy answer. I think the reality is that much that 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 much that you would like to discover has already been discovered, so to speak. There's only so many times you can sort of keep going down the rabbit hole. So then you have to say to yourself, well, who's coming, as opposed to who's been. Um, I think early Parmigiani remains to my to my mind in terms of quality and design, the most interesting as yet kind of undervalued neo vintage independent watchmaker um and i mean that you know with every sincerity i, I find the memory times and um yeah. some of the that early first GMT touring was just fabulous stunning stunning but also you know there's some insane insane split second chronographs that were made uh that, that blow your mind um he he says not dropping too much of a hint um and um otherwise yeah, I'm, I'm kind of just, I'm really interested in, in, I'm really excited about what's coming and and some of the watchmakers like Sylvain Pinot, um, mm. and, uh, you know, Théo Frey, um, and, and a number of others who I think, you know, uh, Bernard Schwinz of Vinyl, I, I, you know, there's, there's some really promising and interesting stuff coming. And I think that stuff kind of excites me just as much. Um, you know, I was with Recep on Monday. Um, you know, I'm always excited about what he's doing. You know, I know what Florian Gael are doing at Peter Mimbedan, and, and that's super exciting. It's it's a great time to be an independent watchmaking. It's a great time to be an independent watchmaking king collector. You know, mm. so um, there's there's every room for optimism and enthusiasm. Absolutely, well said. Thank you. All right, well, Silas, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, happy holidays. Keep in touch. Thank you very much. And we wish you the best Cheers. as we close out the year. Right. <laughs>